Hi, I'm Greg Weimer with Confluence Financial Partners, and we know this is a challenging time, and we wanted to have a conversation about what's going on in the market, what's going on in the world, and our perspective and how we can help you navigate. To help you with that conversation, I have Jim Wadding, partner, Confluence, and I have Bill Winkler, and Bill is the Director of Investments. All three of us happen to serve on the Investment Advisory Committee, and we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how to help navigate these challenging times. So while these challenging times, unfortunately, aren't all that unusual, looking back in my career, I've had 20 years where the market's gone down 10% or more. Nine of those years um, has it's gone down over 20, including this year. And that's a challenge, right? But the good news is 100% of the time, the patient recovered. And our firm belief is this will be, we will recover through this one also. That does not mean that the, the events around these challenging times aren't always unusual and unsettling. In challenging times, the one question people tend to ask, and they, they ask us often, is, is it different this time? And so to help answer that question, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill. Is it different this time? You know, Greg, that's the that's age old question, but as you said, it, I don't think it ever is. And I think the, the historical context is important. Um, every, decline, every decline feels different. But it is important to remember once every three years, equity markets typically fall 15%. Once every six years, we experience what we're going through today, uh, which is about a 20% drop or more. And every time, it's been caused by something different. The catalysts today are, are fairly unique in the sense that we are dealing with the highest levels of inflation in about 40 years. And how we got here uh, wasn't necessarily a linear journey. Heading into this year, Investors had expected a modest increase in, in short-term interest rates as the Federal Reserve started to hike interest rates. Inflation seemingly was under control. And then in February and March, we had the escalation of the conflict in Ukraine, which ultimately worsened the supply chain issues and then subsequently also caused significant issues with commodities. So flash forward, and we now have the Federal Reserve launching one of the more aggressive approaches to try to tame inflation with uh, the market now expecting about 14, 25 basis points or quarter percent interest rate increases. It was only expecting one 25 basis point increase in last fall. So that's a pretty significant change in expectations. So Bill, just, just to follow up on that, to recap. Yeah. So inflation's clearly a challenge right now. The Fed is attacking it aggressively. Maybe a little late, but now at least they're, they're aggressive. So the question is, well, they overshoot, and what what do you see? What what do you is the likelihood of a recession? And if there is a recession, what does that ultimately mean to the markets? Yeah, great question. So starting with the, the, the Federal Reserve's policy, so they're they're attacking it in two ways. One, they're raising short-term interest rates or raising the Fed funds rate. They're projecting the Fed funds rate to be about three point four percent by the end of this year. So that's another one and a half to 1.75% more interest rate increases between now and December. Secondly, they're also shrinking the size of their balance sheet. We all have heard about quantitative easing, where the Federal Reserve is going into the market and buying securities in an attempt to reduce interest rates and spur uh, economic activity. They're actually undoing that, they're doing the opposite. They're allowing their balance sheet or their holdings to shrink. In a sense, they're taking liquidity out of the market. So. What does that mean? The, the concern and a lot of the recent questions to the Federal Reserve and economists have been, do we have to have a recession in order to tame inflation? Will the Fed's policies cause a recession? Economists and the Federal Reserve have still said they see chances of a soft landing, meaning a reduction in inflation, but slowing growth, but not a full recession. We, won't, we don't really know what will ultimately happen. Fundamentally speaking, there's a lot of signs that consumers and the economy are still in really strong shape. But it is clear that inflation is starting to take a bite out of growth and it is weighing on economic growth in the near term. So that is the that is the big question, and that is one of the reasons why investors are seeking a lot of clarity over the next three to four months as to what is the ultimate path. Does the Fed have to exceed what the expectations are like they have been? Or is there a chance where they actually undershoot what they've forecasted? And that will be really important for the ultimate direction of the economy through the end of the year. Quick definition of recession. Yeah, there's a couple different definitions. The most widely followed one is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. It is important to remember we had a negative growth in the first quarter. So uh, right now, a lot of indicators are indicating flat GDP growth for the second quarter. So it is possible. Again, we won't know until after the fact that we do see a recession based on two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Uh, we won't know until a July 
and frankly, uh, equity markets tend to lead the economy anyway. It is interesting when the market's bumpy like this, people tend to shorten their time horizons. And, and the exact opposite should happen. We should be increasing our time horizons. So it is also important to note a recession is not the end of the world. It is a normal part of the business cycle and recessions, just like down markets, do occur. And the market survives them and they do come and go. So that's not to suggest we root for a recession, but it is a normal part of the business cycle that I think now with people so focused on the short term, they're feeling the concern about that maybe a little bit more intensely than normal. Yeah, and the market's starting to price a lot of that probability in. If you look at where the market stands, it's down over 20%. And uh, on average, going back to World War II, there's been 12 recessions. Equity markets have typically uh, fallen and bottomed out at six to seven months ahead of a recession officially starting and have dropped a median of about 24%. So again, um, as far as what we've priced in today, the market is reflecting a lot of bad news, which gets back to the point as to long-term investors extending your time horizon you now have the chance to, to buy equities below their 25-year average for really the, the first time in probably the last 10 years. So it's all about extending your time horizon and not being um, caught up in the short-term minutia. I think it's important you said that the market has some of this priced in. The market doesn't respond typically to what we're worried about. It's what we weren't worried about that occurred, right? So it's the unexpected. And so you tend not to get hit by the bus that you're watching the unexpected, so the increase in interest rates above and beyond what we expected caused some downturn in the market. Thanks, Bill. We really appreciate the comments. And um, I think there are some green shoots out there that I think are worth noting, and I'll, and I'll give you two, and then I'll turn it over to Jim. The first green shoot is, it, this is a midterm election year. And it is important to note when you look at midterm election years historically, the second half of the year usually is way stronger than the first half, and more specifically, the fourth quarter. So I, th I think there's, and we may be going into gridlock in Washington, and I think the market would look at that favorably. The second thing is interesting. How we feel matters. The University of Michigan has a consumer sentiment index, and JP Morgan did some work, and they said, okay, let's look at this index. And let me tell you what it says briefly, and then if you want more information, I'll tell you how to get it. When we feel positive, so the index is at a peak, so we feel good about the world, the average return of the S&P 500 is 4%. So not bad. We feel good about ourselves. Next 12 months, typically, going back to the 70s, 4% next 12 months. When we feel horrible, and I'm talking with folks, I think this qualifies. We don't feel, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. We feel horrible. We're concerned. We're worried. The sentiment hits a trough. It's really low right now, and it's starting to feel like it. Next 12 months, market return, S&P 500. 24.9. That is not making a prediction. That is just saying when we don't feel good, that's what it means when the market's low. When we feel really good, that's what it means when the market's hot. And the S&P 500, JP Morgan, University of Michigan did some work on that to show when we get the calls why we're like, okay, we don't feel very good. And usually that's when the market's bottoming. So take some comfort in that, that uncomfortable feeling. If you would like the chart that I'm referring to, you could certainly contact us. You could, you could send me an email, I'll be happy to send it. It's greg.weimer at confluencefp.com. Or you could call us on, on our local number, 724-271-8801. And we'll be, happy to, we'll be happy to send you the chart and have a conversation. So to continue the conversation about what we're doing internally, where there's a lot of work going on at Confluence, to make sure we're helping you navigate these waters. And, and Jim, with that view of the world, why don't you talk about some of the things internally we're doing in the Investment Advisory Committee? Go. Thanks, Greg. On the Investment Advisory Committee, we don't uh, attempt to forecast uh, in the very short term what the stock market might do. Consistent with your plans and your long-term goals, we try to manage the portfolios the best we can over time. And so that doesn't mean we never make changes but it does mean that we're not gonna make a reaction to something that might occur in 60 days. One of the things that has been a change that we're making in the portfolios is increasing our focus on income. So dividend paying stocks uh, traditionally have done much better when we're going through periods like we're going through right now. Sometimes people refer to that as a value stock versus a growth stock. But generally, those kind of companies are focused on their bottom line. And over time, that has helped uh, the returns, even when we're going through a really 
you know, volatile market. So the investment advisory committee, we try to manage the portfolios and sync them up with your long-term goals. Our changes, when we make changes to the portfolios, aren't going to be ones where we're trying to anticipate might, what might happen in the next month or two, but we are looking longer term. So where we are today is a lot different than where we were a few years ago. Just as a reminder, a few years ago, the 10-year treasury, the government bond, the interest on that was actually less than 1%. It's now pushing 3.5%. So that's a different look that we now have. And we think in quite a few of the portfolios, focusing on increased income is going to help over time. That also goes with stocks too. Dividend growers and dividend payers have historically done much better during times like these. Sometimes you might hear them referred to as value stocks. And the focus there is really more on the bottom line of the company as opposed to the top line growth. Growth stocks outperformed from about 2007 till about a year ago. And those dividend payers really started picking up within the last year. And we think that could go on for quite some time. We don't know exactly where interest rates are gonna end up, but we certainly feel more comfortable owning some fixed income in a world where we're getting three and a half to four and a half percent, depending on what type of bonds you have. Over time, that might go up a bit more. During Greg's and my lifetime, the average interest rate on the 10 year government bond is about 6%. So it, it could certainly go up a bit more from here, but obviously where we are now, you can get a decent return in fixed income compared to where we were just a couple of years ago. And I, and I think it's important to note that represents a change. I think it was uh, three or four years ago, we were looking at bonds and, and saying, what percentage of bonds we put in certain portfolios? And uh, rates were so low, it was just really hard to make that. And in hindsight, it was the right decision, but it was really hard to make that case. I think, unfortunately, some people thought, oh, you guys don't like bonds, you just like equities. But not the case. It's just they were they were not good investments at that time. Today, it's a little different. And the dividend payers, the same is true, and the dividend payers you know, in an increasing interest rate environment tend to do a lot better. And yet, when you think about it this way, if you're running a one-mile race and you can get a half-mile lead, you're likely to win. Even if you're a little slower, you're gonna win, and so that, that's the dividend. So if we can get a dividend, if you need 4% to support your lifestyle, and we can get over 2% in a dividend, that's really helpful to the odds of success. So if you're a one mile race, get a half mile lead, chance of winning. And in the long-term history of the stock market, dividends actually have played a very important, important part of your total return. There's been a shorter period of time where all that was the return was the growth, not the dividend. And some people, maybe if you haven't been investing real long, you might just think it's all about the growth. Uh, but as Greg said, getting that head start has actually been a helper for most of the time that stocks have been an option to invest in. So Jim, a lot going on, some bad news. If you could tell investors one thing, if they would just leave them with one thing, what piece of advice would you give? That's a great question, Greg. And I think the thing that all of our clients need to do is think a little bit longer term. Greg said a little bit earlier that during these difficult times, we tend to think shorter term. And most of us, we're looking at CNBC at the end of the day. We wanna see what the market's doing day by day. Very, very natural to do that. What really makes most sense is to go back to that belief in, you know what, we've never had a decline in the stock market that we didn't fully recover from. And this time, though some of the circumstances are different, the final outcome is not gonna be any different. I would say the number one advice that we should be given to our clients is to stay focused on the long term. Bill, Jim, thank you. And thank you for listening. Would love to continue the conversation. If you're one of our clients and would like to review your plan, please give us a call. We stand ready to help. If you're someone that may not be working with us currently, we stand ready to give you a second opinion. We do know these are challenging times. We do know you're counting on us, and we do promise we are going to work as hard as we can to help you navigate and not let you down.